know a lot of folks have been speaking about how you have to prepare your presentation for this conference about nine months in advance. And you have this sort of idea that's gestated in your mind, and you present it and you, you, you propose it, and over time, that really changes. And I was actually speaking with Scott, and Scott was talking about some stuff, and then I was talking about what I was going to present on, and I realized I'm not really talking about management per se, but I am talking about some techniques that I use to effectively create and manage and evaluate threat intelligence, technical threat intelligence data. And I think there's a lot of cool concepts here that I've never seen presented elsewhere or conceptualized in these same ways. So I really hope a lot of folks take these ideas, steal them, implement them in the best ways possible for themselves. In my mindset, in the private sector world, threat intelligence really supports three different functions. Operationally, it supports and helps you out and helps you evaluate what you should do after you've detected threat X, where threat is maybe malware, an actor, or an exploit. I guess in Rob Lee's mind, it, does, it is not a vulnerability. <laughs> um, you can also support strategy with threat intelligence, and in that case, you're really trying to determine what threats and what issues you should spend your limited security budget on. The last bit is kind of the technical or tactical threat intelligence bit, and that's really based upon how do you detect or protect against threat X. And for the most part, this entire presentation is based upon that last bullet point there. When you take a look at IOCs, a lot of folks, the first thing that they do whenever they're looking at them is they just count them. They wanna know how many IOCs am I getting from this feed or from this data source? And in this slide, we've got three different areas that we're pulling data in from. One of them is the abuse.ch feeds, and this is the aggregate of them all, you know, FATO tracker, SSL tracker, Zeus tracker, what have you. And you're really only getting a couple hundred of IOCs per month from that feed. From OSINT, in this case, what we're doing is we're actually just scraping all of the blog sources that we can find and running them through an algorithm trying to prevent false positives and only pull in those high fidelity indicators into our system. Again, that's really only a couple hundred every month. The next feed there is Brad's malware traffic analysis blog and the IOCs that come from there, largely based upon exploit kits and uh, opportunistic crimeware. Again, another only a few hundred IOCs per month. The kind of next step that a lot of folks take is they bounce them against their logs and their sims and what have you and determine what is the true to false positive rate of these IOCs. How many false positives am I getting? How many true positives am I getting? This is really missing a significant bit of the problem and that's all of those IOCs here in the red are non-actionable. You're pulling them in, you don't really know what to do with them, you're evaluating them, your folks are marking them as non-actionable. In my opinion, that's way worse than just about every other uh, category here. I wanna know if it's a true or false positive. All the non-actionable bits are things that somebody may have thought was malicious. I'm finding them in my environment, but we don't know what to do about it and we can't effectively triage those in those cases. We spent a few weeks back in July trying to make those two points converge where there were no non-actionable events that we were actually seeing out in the wild. Um, the, the team was really kind of stressed out after I pushed them this way, but uh, we, we got it for a little bit and then it quickly spread apart. You really need a large amount of threat analysts in order to dig into all the IOCs that you're seeing and that are coming into your environment and to make sure that they all have context. So one of the best ways to make sure that all of your IOCs have context is to create them yourself. And in this case, there are two categories of feeds here. One of them is based upon malware data and in one of those cases, the backdoor feed, it runs malware through a sandbox as well as config dumps the malware. 
And when I say config dumps, I mean you take the malware, you walk the binary structure of it, you find the C2s, persistence mechanisms, mutexes, and so forth from that piece of malware, and then you ingest those. But now you know the exact sample and the exact malware family that that came from. So you have all of that context to go along with this. The malware IOC's feed is taking over for the other feeds, and then the rat hunter is just based upon the Kev the Hermit style uh, config dumpers. When you look at those feeds, there's thousands of IOCs coming in every month. It looks like those are maybe more valuable. But the other feeds here on the right are based upon indicator expansion. And when I say that, I mean taking criteria, and in our cases, we found that just taking the pivot on DNS data to a known IP address was really false positive prone. But if you take the registrant information, such as an email address, and then additional information, such as the name servers that are being pointed to for those newly registered domains, and use that as the criteria to pull it in, you can really create some really high value indicator feeds. When we were looking at that data, it took a lot of human effort to stay up on those malicious actors, and largely crimeware actors and bulletproof hosters. And we were only getting about 200 indicators a month or so versus those thousands of indicators. And that's one way to evaluate it, but it's really not telling the whole story here. In my view and in, in, in my perspective, the best metric for determining the value of the threat intelligence that you're bringing in and the value of your detections is whether or not you're reducing dwell time. And these statistics are from Mandy and Semtrend's report where the external notification median time is, mean time is 320 days. The internal median, or the overall median time is 146 days. And if you're discovering the intrusions yourself, with your own detection criteria, it tends to be about 56 days between when the actor has gotten established persistence inside your environment to when you've detected them. So if we take the IOCs that we're bringing and that we're creating ourselves, and we want to measure how well that is going to help us reduce that dwell time, we've got to understand what the age of the IOC is. In this case, in my, the, the, the actors set up a command and control server, established that on an IP address, then they register domains which are going to point to that IP address in that C2 server, and then they start using that for their operations. Eventually, the actors are going to be discovered, and you're going to find those indicators, and then you're going to apply those to your detection and protection technologies, and at that point, you've established coverage for that IOC. So what I did was I took the time between domain names when they were registered to the time that they were ingested into well, our threat intelligence platform and when we discovered those indicators. And that's the IOC age in my view. You can also do this with malware samples where you take the PE build date and use that as the established uh, start of the malware hash, per se, and then to the point when you've discovered it as the ingestion date. So using that, I created these bullet charts to take a look at how useful are these different feeds. The way to read this chart is the bars along the chart are this feed's median time for the IOC age. The dark gray towards the end is, the, is that external me median time to discovery. The light gray all the way over to the left is the internal median discovery time of 56 days. And that blue bar is the overall median time. If I was working at an internal organization like the small family-owned industrial company here, <laughs> that presented previously, I would put our median time to discovery 
as the blue bar there. Um, and that way you could measure it against how well you're doing and to see if you are improving your dwell time and lowering that. So taking a look at these different feeds, with the OSN scraping that we were doing of all of those blogs that, you know, the Talos Intelligence, Kaspersky's blog, um, Flashpoint's blog, and so forth, scraping those sources, the average, the median IOC age there is actually about 160 days. So that's really not getting us to improve our dwell time and, and getting ahead of the adversaries there. If we just look at the back doors feed, that's the Kev the Hermit's config dumping, you're all the way out at about 340 days. If we look at the malware indicators feed, which includes a lot of crimeware like H1N1, Chanitor, Andromeda, and so forth, that brings us down to 75 days. Now we're getting somewhere, and, and we're starting to lower that dwell time. But then the other thing, that actor's registrant information, the indicator expansion-based feeds, what we found was they're actually, we're actually able to get up on new indicators in two days. And as far as I've been able to tell, that's the quickest methodology that you can use to capture new IOCs and to really get as close to boom in the intrusion lifecycle. The SSL pivoting concept that Mark presented yesterday I think it would also end up about two days, because if you look at that data, you've got to wait for census.io to create the uh, data and present that data, and then you've got to ingest it yourself, which is going to take an additional day. The one problem with the backdoors, as well as the malware indicator feeds, and why the lifetime of those IOCs is so far out in comparison to the others is fundamentally based upon the fact that the actors have to create the malware, the malware has to be delivered, and then it has to be discovered by the defensive organizations, then shared out to some place where you can grab the malware, and then you have to ingest it and pull that in yourself. So you have all of those actions happening before you're able to ingest the indicators. But I... the. I, th I think this is a really useful methodology for evaluating a lot of the indicator feeds that you're probably taking in yourselves at home. And pulling this information and, and creating this information can be done with any one of those domain name API resources like domain tools, passive total, or a threat intelligence platform as well. So, I guess there's this triangle of threat that somebody created in a hotel room at, while they were drinking. And, <laughs> and at the bottom of that are all of the IOCs. But then in the upper half of that, really, in order to detect those sorts of things, it's based upon signatures and analytics and heuristics and models and so forth. And I, I thought of this after I've already submitted these papers or submitted these slides. And I really should change the next couple of slides to detections and not signatures. I think a lot of people get hung up on signatures. But it's been really interesting seeing organizations from uh, the, the, the side that I've been seeing them over the past two years. A lot of orgs are very adverse to signatures. It's been, it's been kind of interesting to see that. And a lot of people only rely upon IOCs for their detection criteria. Previously, as I had worked on more signature-based systems, we had this concept of tactical signatures. And tactical signatures are based around a specific piece of malware or a specific threat. And the great thing about those tactical signatures is if you really want to get ahead of those IOCs being created, you really need signatures so that you can cover all of the IOCs that that malware family is using. And if you take a look at this snort signature here, there's something that you might notice, which is there is not a URI in there. And it's kind of interesting to me. I, I see a lot of signatures created by folks which have URIs in them. And when I was taught to build signatures, I was always taught to look at the headers if you're looking at HTTP traffic and to try to work on those rather than on the IOC-based bits of 
URIs and domains and so forth. And in this case, this oil rig backdoor, the interesting thing that I saw there was the content type is binary, care set, UTF-8. And that's kind of odd. It should really be content type text, UTF-8. Binary UTF-8 is weird. I, I took a look through a lot of web proxies, and I didn't see anything that actually uses that content type. So I'm pretty sure that's unique to this malware and one of those odd um, situations. Strategic signatures are a little different. And in these cases, what you're looking for are the entire tactic or technique that an actor is using or malicious people are using. And you're trying to create a signature which will catch that entire technique and then therefore catch multiple families of malware as well. What Ronnie was talking about yesterday with the XOR encoded P headers of this program cannot be run in DOS mode and so forth, that will be a strategic signature because their XOR encoding, lots of people XOR encode binaries and try to pass them over the wire to get past just looking for that MZ header. And creating the signatures for all of the XOR, all of the possible XOR keys will allow you to detect all of that. Does that make sense? And then there are strategic protections, such as two-factor authentication if you're dealing with a lot of credential exposures. And then it's always nice to put some real numbers on things every so often. A lot of folks talk about blocking dynamic DNS, but in, and it seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. But from the data that we've been pulling in, from OSINT scraping, 82% of the domains that we pull in are dynamic DNS. From the config dumping of all of the malware, 96% of the domains that we find in the, that config dumped malware are dynamic DNS domains. That's kind of interesting to me. So hopefully you can take those and use those as a uh, statistic to further bolster the case of blocking dynamic DNS in your organizations. The last topic that I wanted to hit here is this concept of coverage. And Alex, I think, has a couple of questions regarding this. When we start tracking threats, there, there's a lot of people that talk about tracking threats. And you might establish some sort of automated system to track threats, or you might be tracking a threat internally using you know, a, the kill chain and the campaigns that you have coming into your organization and so forth. And this concept works both from intrusion data within your organization, as well as from IOCs that you're gathering around an, an, a specific threat, as well as from numbers of samples that you're gathering for a specific piece of malware or the toolkits for a specific actor group. In essence, what you do is the bottom left here is the pure volume over each time period for each one of these threats, quote unquote. The radar chart in the upper right is really the piece that's helping you track and understand how much of that threat you're actually looking at. Along the edges here are the maximum amount of data that you've ever seen for threat whatever over that time period, say it's a month, say it's a week. The purple lines in the chart are the mean amount, the average amount of data that you see for each one of these threats. And then the blue lines are based upon the amount of data that you've collected over this time period for that threat. So in this slide, we see the Extreme Web Bulletproof Hoster the blue line almost meets the purple line there. So we've got pretty good coverage on them. We know that we have uh, the same amount of data that we typically bring in for that threat that we're looking at. Pin SPB, another bulletproof hoster, we're bringing in the same amount of data that we always see for them. We're pretty solid there. The Drydex activity, same thing. Same, pretty average, pretty standard. The manipulators, though, the blue line is 
significantly inside that purple line. In this case, we're probably missing something. And whenever you see this, there was a question during the last talk about how do you prioritize what you're looking at. In this case, I would prioritize my analysts to take a look at the manipulators again to see what we're missing. Why aren't we seeing them? Why did we collect less information about them over this time period? But then the server activity in this chart is all the way out to the edge of the graph. So we've collected more information regarding server during this time period than any time period before, and it's way farther than the average or mean amount of activity that we've collected. And the top of the graph that's cut off a little there is based upon the pony information. And again, we're missing significant amounts of data. So what happened? Do they no longer use pony? Did they move on to a new tool set? Or is it a holiday somewhere? What have you. So the last two slides really are just summaries of the information that I've presented thus far. If your goal really is to reduce dwell time, measuring the IOC age is a good way to find data. And measuring the IOC age and orienting towards the IOCs that are most new and have the lowest age is a good way to reduce dwell time. But it's better to use tactical signatures. And the best way to truly reduce dwell time is to focus on those strategic sig signatures and get those out. One of, uh, and I forgot to mention this on that slide, but a really good source for, in, in my opinion, the best source for data to be used for strategic signatures is to watch penetration testers and watch what they're blogging about, watch what they're presenting about, and take their tactics, because usually the penetration testers will come up with new, some new technique, like on HarmJoy's blog, the Kerber roasting over the past couple of weeks. Figure out how to detect that activity and have your threat analysts and your detection analysts focus on creating detections for that kind of activity. And in a few weeks, you might see, a few weeks to a few months, you might see the real actors using those techniques against you. But now you already have protections and detections in place before they've even adopted those new techniques. If you want to ensure coverage for a specific threat, establish a baseline of the threat activity, and then measure the captured, the percent captured during this time period against your baseline and mean amount captured of that activity. If you want to focus on useful detections, measure the enrichment and reduction of non-actionable alerts more so than just the pure false positive and true positive alerts. And the last little bit down here is the collected IOCs, and a lot of times there, there, there's a real hyper focus in our industry on IOCs and feeds and maybe the things that are in the news. And in all reality, the collected IOCs that a lot of folks have inside feeds and so forth are not equivalent to the activity that's on the ground from true intrusion data. And building upon that true intrusion data is the best source of information and initial information that you can have. But the OSINT data is useful to initially alert and prioritize around. And this is just the graph of detection utility again. So that's uh, the extent of my presentation.